Our first speaker is a real pro, knows what he's doing. He's also spoken at this conference before, before we all got COVID. We're really pleased to have him back four years after he was here. He's still with us. Big, genuine round of applause for Kevlin Henney. Thank you very much, David. Okay, so um, if we could switch to my screen, it should be black. Okay, now we're having the other technology. Ah, excellent. Right, so um, that is how I felt this morning. Slightly non-functional when I woke up. Um, I have a sufficiently internet unique name that I'm quite easy to find, and therefore that is my Twitter handle. Um, but I'm here to talk about not just non-functional, but non-functional coding. So there is an interesting question, and I want to go back to the whole non-functional Kevlin Henney thing um, as, as a way of introducing myself. Um, if we look at the dictionary, non-functional is an adjective. That means it describes something. By default, it means having no function. I want you to think about that when we talk about non-functional requirements. What are your NFRs? I don't want it to do anything. We, oh, that's easy. I will send you the invoice. Job done. Actually, in English, the more common meaning is broken. What are your non-functional requirements? Uh, you know what? We'd like it to crash every Friday. We want a major outage on Fridays, please. That's our non-functional requirement. We would like it not to function on Fridays. I mean, I don't function on Fridays, so why should anybody else? However, this idea of broken has kind of become a thing. Um, I've even made it into Urban Dictionary. I don't know who put this entry in there, but um, I've become identified with software failure. Um, a software failure that happens in some public space, for instance, an airport flight information screen that has crashed, an ATM displays displaying a reboot message. So, um, you know, people get named after different things. And I have been asked, Kevin, what's it like to be associated with failure? It's not my main life ambition, but it's not a bad one. So it's become enough of a thing that I was at this, So I'm based in Bristol. Uh, in the UK, so that's 200 kilometers west of London for those of you who are looking for it. If you fall in the water, you've gone too far, okay? That's your stopping condition. Bristol is just before you fall in the water. Agile in the city, 2016, the, um, the conference organizer, John Clapham, said to me, Kevlin, there's a Kevlin Henny downstairs. And I was going, no, it's sufficiently internet unique, there's only one here. And he said, no, no, there's one downstairs, and I want you to stand in front of it so I can take a photograph and then retweet it and then you retweet it. So we did this again the following year in 2017. And then at DevTernity in Latvia, Guillaume Laforge caught this inception moment. So that's kind of an introduction. I've even made it onto the register. Um, the idea of at Kevin Henney's frequently seen at ATMs, supermarket checkouts and so on. The key thing, though, is being tweeted to my account. I, I used to get sent these by email, and then social media happened, and then people started adding me with this stuff. I started retweeting it. It becomes a public service, because I sometimes retweet things, and then the train company will say, oh, which station was this? So I like to think I'm actually doing some public good here. Um, but I'm interested here, not in general failure, I want to talk about the code. So here's a good example. We're going to talk a little bit about time later. Not sure if I'm time traveling, but pretty sure there is no minus 1 AM or PM. Yeah, minus, that, that's not really a time. In fact, it turns out that time is one of the areas that we as developers mess up quite a lot. Um, before, before Facebook started messing with democracy, um, I had this message. Uh, Your feedback will be used to improve face Facebook. That is a false statement. Thanks for taking the time. How much time? A long time. We'll come back to this one later. Of course, many of us deal with money. It turns out that using the PayPal app, you can't pay for anything, according to this error. And somewhere, somebody got an if statement wrong. And then this profound insight from Lufthansa. Did you know that NAN is not a number? Well, thank you. 
And this one was sent to me. Many people know that in Canada, people speak, it, Canada is officially bilingual, French, English, trilingual, PHP. We're going to talk about object structure as well. And if we are going to use this term, NFR, I hate NFRs. I'm on a personal crusade to try and get us to not use this term, non-functional requirement. In fact, because it's not just that non-functional means it doesn't work. It's the fact that it's not very imaginative. What are, the, what are these requirements? These are functional. What are these ones? Well, they're not those. Really? Is that the best we can do? I mean, I, you know, it's one of those things of like, I'm going to name a variable, I. What's the next variable going to name? I don't know, not I. Really, we can do better. So there is actually an ISO standard, ISO IEC 25010. Kind of rolls off the tongue. If you think that's hard, you should see the actual title. That is the actual title of that standard. I've been involved in international standards, not this one, but this is probably the longest title of any of them. But what's interesting is that this talks about requirements and qualities. If you want to talk about requirements and qualities, of a system. It has a little list. It's quite a little list. And I want to remind you that this stuff is the functional stuff. This stuff is the not functional. Yeah, it's kind of big. Yeah, so we really, we need better terms. But of course, the reason I'm talking about this stuff at least according to the outline that I submitted many months ago. In fact, before I realized they were going to make this a keynote. So there will be code. I am not I'm not going to apologize for that, but I will explain it. We're going to talk about functional programming, and not as opposed to dysfunctional programming. A lot of people kind of been very interested in functional programming the last few years. Many people kind of recognize maybe they can't or are not in a position to apply it fully in their work environment. Sometimes the languages they use, they kind of say, well, you know, I'm doing hybrid functional programming. You know, it's not 100% functional. I've even heard people calling it pragmatic uh, functional programming. However, I have a kind of a simple rule book for translation. When people use the word pragmatic, it normally means not. OK, so we're doing pragmatic agile development. Trans Google Translate, please help me with this. We are not doing agile development. We are doing pragmatic TDD. We are not doing TDD. We are doing pragmatic functional programming. We are not functional programming. In fact, we have a name for not functional programming. It's called procedural programming. And in fact, I want to talk more strictly about, or more generally, about the idea of imperative programming. Procedural programming belongs to a larger category. Im imperative comes from the Latin, imperare which means to command. Do this, do that. Don't fall under a train. You saw it earlier. That's a command. These are command-based. Now, the other way of looking at it is non-declarative. A lot of people say functional when they actually mean declarative. I'm going to use the terms a little bit interchangeably, but I'll draw attention to the fact they are not the same. Sometimes I'll just talk about things being functional or non-functional. But many people do. But it's worth having the distinction in your head. And I want to go back to 1977. This is John Backus, who gave us the most imperative language that I have ever programmed in. And I hated every second of it, Fortran. He did that in 1957. So I'm not going to blame him for that. He apologized for it, basically, by this paper in 20 years later. Fortran is one of the most relentlessly imperative languages. It is a pain in the backside. If you are being paid by the line of code, I recommend Fortran. OK? Um, I lost a lot of time to Fortran. And we're going to talk about time. But 20 years later, he's saying, we need to release ourselves. Can uh, he was awarded the um, Turing Award in 1977. And probably the longest title of any of the Turing Award speeches um, can programming be liberated from the von Neumann style, a functional style and its algebra of programs? Nice snappy title, OK? It's kind of like he names enterprise variables like this. Um, so his kind of goal was like, yeah, I was, we were experimenting at IBM in the 1950s, trying to create compilers that were possible. That was the 1950s. It's the 1970s now. It's time to move on. He characterized this. Um, 
This one says, conventional programming languages are basically high-level complex versions of the von Neumann computer, referring to John von Neumann, who was born not far from here. Von Neumann programming languages use variables to imitate the computer's storage cells, control statements to elaborate its jump and test instructions, assignment statements to imitate its fetching, storing, and arithmetic. In fact, he has a really hard time with the fact that we've ended up with programming languages that basically emulate this, and he has a particular hatred of assignment statements. And that was in the late 1970s. Here we are in the early 2020s. How are we doing? I'd say not so good. So this is code I don't intend you to read, which is why I haven't changed the font size. This is taken from a coding carter, the Gilded Rose Carter. I was first properly introduced to this by Emily Batch, who's tomorrow morning's keynote speaker. Um, and one of the things I love about this is it's, it's basically it's a lot like enterprise code. It's messy logic. It's trying to do business logic. And it's scruffy. And it, oh, it's terrible. But the funny thing is what people do with it and when they start refactoring. They start either they say, right, I'm going to extract methods everywhere, or I'm going to introduce classes everywhere. What they end up with is worse in many ways than what they started with. That is entirely the wrong way to go about refactoring. But I want to focus. I'm going to look for something different. What, first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of the punctuation. I'm going to get rid of the noise that doesn't contribute to anything meaningful. What we are left with is a bunch of tests and assignments, exactly what John von Neumann was talking about. If we look closer, all of those things in white, so that's all I want you to get is the impression, all of these are where state changes. This is where things change value. These are all assignments. Now, if I narrow it down, I'm going to focus on just one particular value that gets assigned to many, many places. Ultimately, the whole of this method is about that thing that you now see in white. It's all over the place. There's no one location. So for me, I don't start by saying, I wonder if I can extract methods. I start by saying, well, what's changing? Why does this thing exist? It exists primarily because of this thing called quality. And if I look a little bit further, these are all the conditions. We're checking the same thing many, many times. We're checking, assigning, and checking, assigning. If you're being paid by this, this is a fantastic methodology, and you can ignore everything I'm going to say. But really, this is a lot of change. When people think about functional programming, they talk about not changing. So here, interestingly, everything I've now got here, what's the significance of this? This, in this path of code, that value, that variable is assigned to four times. It's kind of like we, can't, it's kind of like we have some kind of obsession with it. We can't leave it alone. Okay? It's, like, you know, it's like telling a kid, stop picking your nose. You know? Yeah, I can't help it. I've got, to, I've, got to, I've got to assign to this variable. So let me offer you a solution. If you treat this as a control flow problem, you will get some distance. If you treat it as a state change problem, it's not an object-oriented problem. Any solution to the gilded Rose Carter that uses objects will always be more complex than most other solutions. It is not an object-oriented problem. It starts with control flow, but ultimately it is about changing a value. Here is, one, here is a solution that is still based on control flow, but now organizes it around one value. But what I want to highlight to you at this point, let's get rid of the, synta the syntactic extra. That stuff in white is all of the state change that happens now. It's in one place. We might not be able to do perfect functional programming, but we can at least make it clear. Here is everything else. This is the only place assignment occurs. Anything before that is not assignment, it's initialization. And that quality that I was talking about keeps getting changed, one place. But this still relies on control flow. It's not bad. It's, in fact, it's a far better solution than most of the, the recommended solutions I see online. My favorite solution is this one, though. This one is declarative. It basically uses pattern matching. It says there is a rule. In other words, that we're trying to apply a rule, as we normally do in business. If I get rid of the extra noise, let's look at the state change. There it is again. I describe the rules, then I run the rules. That is it. I have eliminated most of the control flow, not all of it, but most of the control flow that is associated with the von Neumann style. So what we see here, that is the one place that we change that value. 
what we're trying to find when we refactor was put nicely by Dijkstra. We're abstracting. We're trying to find the level we can be the most precise about. There is one place, there is one thing we are trying to change. Why are we changing it in four different places or on one path or eight different places across the whole code of that single method? So von Neumann had this point. He was saying programming languages appear to be in trouble. That was 1977. How are we doing now? So what are the most popular languages? There is no single answer to this question, but there are a number of sources you may have come across. So here's the Tyobi index. Okay, this is one of the most frequently quoted and retweeted. There is also the Red Monk approach. They use a slightly different methodology to arrive at what's popular. And I've taken a third one, IEEE Spectrum. There's a bit of a spoiler on this one. You can kind of guess which one came out top. Now, if we do that, let's look at this. This is the top 20 languages in the last year or so from Tyobi. This is the top 20 from Red Monk, and this is the top 20 from um, uh, IEEE Spectrum. I am going to simplify a few things here. First of all, Delphi and Object Pascal. I don't think there is any Object Pascal that qualifies as being in the top 10 that is not Delphi. I'm just going to simplify it and say, that's it. We're done. The next thing I want to do is, um, I think, Arduino. Or am I going to get rid of Arduino? No, not yet. Oh, yeah, I'm going to get rid of classic Visual Basic because, honestly, no, it's just going to be Visual Basic. One entry is enough. Then I'm going to get rid of Arduino because that's actually C and C++. Although it's a constrained dialect, it's not a dialect with an army. Arduino is, is not a programming language, so I'm going to eliminate it. The next thing I'm going to do is get rid of shell and assembly. Shell is not a programming language, neither is assembly. These are language categories, so let's get rid of them. OK, now, what are we left with? We're left with quite a few things. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of duplicates. Then I'm going to do an arbitrary sort, and that leaves us with 27 languages. Let's sort these alphabetically, which doesn't tell us very much, but it does allow you to do a fast lookup. OK, is my language there? Is my language there? Of course your language is probably there. I'll tell you why. Because let's organize these by when these languages were introduced. Um, so remember that we in software development wander around saying we are technical, we are technological, we are innovative, we are at the leading edge. This is how leading edge we are. Yeah, most of these, the, we've got languages that are going back before most of you were born. If you were born in the 1990s, you're in good company. There's a kind of a bump there. It gets, but the picture gets more interesting. What about the languages that qualified in any of the top tens? Ooh, yeah, kind of old. We're not really very progressive as a development, as, a, as, a, as an industry. We're not as good as we think we are. As William Faulkner observed, the past is never dead. It's not even past. Everybody as a developer is programming in the past. Every time you sit down to write code, you are programming in the past. You're not programming in the future. If you work an eight-hour day, seven, seven hours of that day is dealing with things that came from the past. One hour at most is dealt with the future. And that's if you're lucky. Some people just spend eight hours living in the past. Hey, the music was great. That's all I can say. But let's get to another point here. I want to look at these from another point of view. I'm going to list out all of the languages of the 27 here that are declarative and were created to be declarative. There you go. Now, we might argue about CSS and HTML being included there because they are not computationally complete. CSS plus HTML plus events is computationally complete, but individually, they're not. But that's all the declarative languages. And that was basically, that's not even this century. We haven't even got into the 21st century here. And people keep going, oh, yeah, functional programming. It's really going to take off. Or maybe declarative programming. Maybe not. OK, let's, let's loosen things up a bit. Let's add in the languages that were explicitly intended by design in their original form to be hybrid languages, to embrace functional programming. There you go. That's the 2000s. OK. 
Those are the only two, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to argue the difference on the others, but no, those are the only two that even remotely were intended as hybrid languages that embraced functional programming. Okay, but what about the languages that have been changed normally in response to people saying, we need functional features? Ah, at this point, things begin to look a little bit more familiar. So there's an interesting observation here. A number of people thought that functional programming was going to become increasingly popular. Kind of. They thought it was becoming a dominant paradigm. No, that opportunity finished around 2015. Functional is never going to become dominant unless something else changes. We're on the current path we're on. No, we're going for, we're integrating, we're borrowing from functional. People have had about as much functional as they can handle. If we look at the practical thing, interest in functional programming has plateaued. You can look at the Google searches for the last few years. People actually aren't that interested. There's a few people who are kind of like, yeah, yeah, but actually it's kind of died off. But that doesn't mean its lessons can't still be learned. But I'm going to go back to von Neumann and what he was actually saying when he says programming languages appear to be in trouble. He says each successive language incorporates with a little cleaning up all the features of its predecessors plus a few more. All the languages are borrowing things in. Oh, everybody's slightly interested in functional programming. We need to add stuff. And occasionally they're presented, in fact, often. And this is interesting because if you've entered the industry, every time somebody enters the industry, because your learning curve is unique to you, you will see things and you go, oh my goodness, this is the most amazing thing ever. I was introduced to this great concept in this language. I wish I'd known about that before. It turns out our problem in software development is we're very bad at history, like really bad at history. Because notice he says claims. So coroutines. Oh, wow, those have become really popular in the last decade. Kotlin added them a few years ago. Python now finally has them properly. Even C++ has them. Everybody has coroutines or wants coroutines or something like coroutines. And a lot of people are going, oh, yeah, these are really cool. This is like new and everything. Some people, I've even heard people say they're functional. They're not. They are procedural. They are very imperative and they are very procedural. That's their origin story. Coroutines date back to 1958. They were invented by somebody called Melvin Conway. If you've heard of Conway's law, that's the same Conway. Conway's law was established 10 years after in 1968. This is Conway's paper on his application of coroutines in the early 1963. It's a really interesting read. So yeah, coroutines, fashionable new feature. Iterators, you know all those, uh, the ability to yield a value, iterator methods. We find them in Ruby, we find them in Python, we find them in C Sharp. Oh man, these are really cool. <laughs> they date back to 1974. This is a paper by Barbara Liskoff and her team. If you've heard of Liskoff's substitution principle, it's that Liskoff. Barbara Liskoff won the Turing Award in 2008 for many of her contributions to distributed computing, but significantly from my perspective, her contributions to language design and programming methodology. Abstract data types, that's Barbara Liskoff. In fact, there's a connection here. Iterators are a form of coroutine. Huh, there we go. A lot of people got excited by channels when Go introduced them. Channels, 1978. I got to program with channels in the early 1990s. Very cool idea. Really helps us think and reason about the difficulties of concurrency. And the interesting thing is if you make them asynchronous and buffered, you can create pipelines. A lot of people have been getting into pipelines, you know, whether it is actually kind of, yes, the shell is a great place, whether you're doing PowerShell or Bash, or whether it is, it's cool, I'm in Java, I'm using Java 8, now I've got streams, and that's great, I can pipeline things. Such a good idea, invented by Doug McElroy in 1964. The Unix pipe was invented in 1964 but it took six years to find the pipe symbol. That was Ken Thompson, six years to find the pipe symbol because keyboards weren't standardized back then. No, they didn't have a symbol for the idea. And what he observed, we should have some ways of coupling programs like garden hoses, screw in another segment when it becomes necessary to massage data in another way. This is the way of IO also. The data flow approach is incredibly powerful. We're gonna come back to that. Oh, Lambda's my favorite. I love lambdas. People get so excited. A lot of people say lambdas are, are, are to do with functional programming. I have some really bad news for you. 
They are to do with object-oriented programming, procedural programming. They are to do with programming. Of course, they have a certain presence in functional programming, but they are not uniquely functional. A lot of people think, oh, I'm working in Java. I've got lambdas, therefore I must be doing this. I'm working in JavaScript. I've got lambdas, therefore I must be doing functional programming. And it's a really recent innovation. So Alonzo Church, 1932. This is before wars had numbers. It's so old. But actually, the, this paper didn't, um, uh, was not successful in what it tried to prove. 1936, this is the paper where Church really went to town. He introduced data abstraction through this. He wasn't trying to do anything that we would recognize. He was trying to demonstrate the universal possibilities of certain things. And it turns out that Lambda calculus and Turing machines, which were invented around the same time, are kind of, they prove the same thing. This is really important. And to make good on the observation I just said, the late William Cook in 2009 made this observation when talking about data abstraction, object orientation, polymorphism. He said lambda calculus was the first object-oriented language. So that kind of gives us an interesting question. Whenever we think of like, oh, this is new, and now, it, uh, now this is radical. It changes my style. I'm now functional. If you've not come across XKCD, then you are in for a real treat. I mean, I could ask, where are you, and where have you been? Hiding at home for the last two years, you've had plenty of time to look at XKCD. But if you've not come across it, Randall Monroe stuff is just the best geek humor. It is just the best. Um, so this one is great, particularly if you did any scientific discipline. And particularly if you're a scientific discipline towards the right-hand side, you get to be smug. You know, sociologists, ah, sociology is just applied psychology. Psychology is just applied biology. Biology is just applied chemistry, which is just applied physics. It's nice to be on top. And then you've got mathematicians. Oh, hey, didn't see you guys over there. Why am I showing you this? Because this is the story of lambdas. Yeah, you, you got Java like, yay, 2014. I've got lambdas. C++ is there. Well, well, yeah, I had them before you. Yeah, remember Java was the language that was supposed to display C++ and, and to be developed in internet time? Yeah, Java got lambdas last. So actually, I should say a couple more things. C Sharp, JavaScript, Lambda for the mass, Lambdas for the Masses, it was once called, mid-1990s. A lot of small talkers are there going like, yeah, we've had those. It's a really object-oriented idea, the idea of being able to pass a block of code around as an object. Yeah, it's so object-oriented. But Lisp, 1960, was the first implementation. So to quote the great Jean-Luc Picard, change always comes later than we think it should. It turns out that history is a surprisingly, a surprisingly surprising place, but mostly because it's quite a dull place when we look at a lot of things. So what does this mean in practice for the stuff that we're going to try and do in terms of things like changes? Let's understand functional programming from another perspective. So from the Haskell website, so Haskell is a very pure, very pure and very complete functional programming language. In fact, Haskellians would say that, you know, theirs is the best. Of course they would. So I'm going to borrow from their site. They say, in functional programming, programs are executed by evaluating expressions. They're expression-oriented, not statement. They're not about commands. They're just declaring, hey, here's a thing. This is what it is. This is not how you do it, but this is what it is. It's about relationships and flow and understanding this. In contrast with imperative programming, where programs are composed of statements which change global state when executed. Now, just to clarify what they mean here, they don't really mean global state in the way that we might say global variables. They mean global state as in there is state that other things can see. It is accessible by something else. Whether by pointer or by scope, you can get your hands on it and see and observe that change. It also means that there are certain habits. So I'm going to borrow a bit of Rust here. There's a particular reason I'm using Rust. I'm sure we're all familiar with how to program a factorial using recursion, because apparently that's the only example that exists to demonstrate recursion in any of the textbooks. That classic, that classic business problem that you've, you know, you've gone in on Monday morning, and somebody from marketing has walked in and said, customer wants factorial. But we're all out of iteration. Recursion will help. Yeah, OK. So it's a toy example, but I, don't want, I didn't want to do a big introduction to an example. This is, a kind of, this is the way that I would write it if I were to write it using um, a, an imperative language 
that um, supports recursion. This is, this is the style I would write. Okay, I'm going to make two branches explicit because there are two branches. This style is compatible with the ideals of single expression programming. It's compatible with the ideals of functional programming. I want to show you a piece of code that is not compatible with functional programming, but is proving to be a very popular style. Because one of the things I want to highlight is the fact that a lot of people are going, oh, we're doing functional type stuff in our non-functional language. But when you look at the code, and when you actually look at the code, it's like, this is really procedural. This style. I've even seen people call this good. I've seen blogs and videos where people have actually advocated this style over this style. You can tell that I'm slightly amazed by this, but that's because I went through a, uh, I, you know, I've still got the scars from Fortran. Remember I mentioned Fortran earlier on? If you have never programmed Fortran, I, I recommend the experience to cure you of the desire to have control flow everywhere and changing state everywhere. It is the ultimate antidote. But the point here is that this is anti-functional. This is not how you should use an if statement. If there is an else, you put the else in. You don't split your decisions and your paths across two different levels. You're causing somebody to look in two different places. It doesn't help the compiler. The compiler will generate the same code. It doesn't actually help the reader, because you're causing them. You're making one thing look more or less important than the other. So let's go back to this and understand why it's compatible with expressions and also why it is that I chose Rust. Because in Rust, I can easily change an if statement to an if expression. You see, I can do that transformation directly. I can't do that with the other piece of code. And in fact, I can make it like this. In other words, the function is an expression. It is just that. It is these two paths. I'm not saying every if should have an else, but if your ifs don't have an else and you immediately return from something afterwards, you are relying on control state. Your programming is more stateful than you realized. It's not a helpful habit. I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just not helpful. It's, it, it confounds reasoning. It actually messes up. It reduces your refactoring opportunities. And it works against many of the things that people say when they say, oh, I'm trying to do functional programming. Oh, by the way, that's the one thing I put in here. I, I always try and make sure there's at least one thing that pisses people off. Because there's probably half of you saying, well, I'm a team lead, and I've been recommending my team do this. I'm sorry, you're wrong. Now, you might not realize you're wrong, and that's OK. We're all wrong in our lives. That's why we lead long lives, to realize how wrong we were when we were young. You might be at this point saying, Kevin's wrong. That's fine. Just let me know when you realize I'm right. I'm, I'm very patient, OK? So here's the thing. Functional programming typically avoids using mutable state. And I'm also including control state. I'm coming back to that. So strictly speaking, we should be saying declarative programming. There are lots of other approaches. They are not about changing state. They are just about declaring relationships. Here is, not here's how you do. This is doing. Declarative is just being which is very zen and very calm. I think we need calm after the last couple of years. One of my favorite paper titles, <laughs> Riddle with Irony, uh, you know, by Pat Helen, The Communications of the ACM, 2015, Immutability Changes Everything. I love this. It's just like, yeah, humor and a point. Now, he's talking about larger scale architecture. Everything I'm talking about in this talk is everything from the smallest piece of code but up to the large scale of architecture. But I'm not going to touch all the big architectural stuff. I'm just going to use small examples. But I want you to know it generalizes. So here's an interesting thought. When many developers, particularly coming from object or object hybrid languages, think about when they think about functional programming, they immediately grasp onto the thing. They say, oh, functional programming, that's about immutable state. That's not strictly true. I mean, it's not strictly false. There is the idea that if you start from the idea of my state is not changeable, that might be a surprise to you. It also, by the way, is very good object orientation. It improves your encapsulation. It's a really interesting consequence. The more immutability you have, the better your encapsulation is. Encapsulation is not just about keeping things private. It's about keeping things contained. And change is something we need to contain. But many people start from the idea Oh, immutable state gives me functional programming. It kind of does. If you have immutable state, by definition, you have pure functions. A pure function is something that doesn't cause a change in state. 
So if I start by saying I'm not going to allow you to change your state, by definition, it follows you get pure functions. Strictly speaking, though, functional programming is the other way. Because it starts not from the idea of state. It starts from the idea of pure functions. Mathematicians don't tend to talk about state, but they are very excited by functions. If I start from pure functions, by definition, that means I'm not changing anything. It goes the other way. I'm happy to say that it goes both ways, but I want you to recognize these are two different paths that lead to the same outcome, but they actually have slightly different philosophies and impacts on existing code. And a nice one from Michael Feathers, who is here somewhere. I don't know if he's here in the room, um, but uh, he's certainly here at the conference. A lovely observation from Michael on these, um, uh, along these lines many years ago. Object orientation makes code understandable by encapsulating moving parts. Functional programming makes code understandable by minimizing moving parts. It's a really interesting way of looking at the interaction between these two ideas. But one of the most important ideas that I want to get across to you is that if you want to be more functional and you're in a language that supports objects, you need to start understanding your objects better because half the story is already found where you are. You don't need to go to another paradigm. If you do objects well, you're already more functional than many of the people trying too hard. So let me give you a very kind of simple example. Um, so imagine that we're creating a date class. I guess we don't need to anymore. I mean, Java util date was a, I, has anybody ever worked with Java util date? I can see the sadness on your faces. You didn't have to raise your hands. I can tell from here, I'm with you. Java Util Date is a magnificent work of art. From it, you can learn almost everything you need to know about how not to design a class. Imagine, one place you can find all of that knowledge. It is a treasure. Anyway, it's been slowly deprecated into the sunset, and there are now better facilities. But let us imagine we were doing this. I mean, oh, yeah, I'm going to get year, get month, get day and month. The problem is that's not, so that's not quite the whole story. Um, I finished this book uh, with Trisha G a couple of years ago under lockdown. Um, 97 things every Java programmer should know. One of the pieces I wrote on Java Util Date was along the lines of date time handling is harder than people expect, even when they're expecting it. OK? If you say, yep, this is going to be hard, you are right, but not right enough. It will be harder than you thought it was. And even, so in other words, actually, when it comes to dealing with what people want from date classes. And this is, I've, I've truncated it just to make sure that we can keep it on the screen. But notice there's all these getters and setters. And the question I've got to ask myself is like, well, all of these setters, that's going to add a lot of code, particularly when I'm asking to change the week in a year. What does that mean? What does that mean? It turns out that Monday, the, fir the first Monday, of, if I got this right, the first Monday of 2020, week one, first Monday, was in 2019. So to change the week in 2019 to the first week of the year may also change the year. Or well, sorry, the first week of 2020 actually is in 2019. So the side effects from this are absolutely fascinating. It turns out, and I have done this, when you write this class, with the getters and the setters, it will be four times longer than if you wrote the class with the getters. And do you know how much more functionality you'll have? None. You are capable of not doing anything more than you would otherwise. But there's another thing here. Why do we end up with all these getters and setters? Because people often think, oh, get and set form a natural pair. No, they don't. They just happen to have the same number of letters in English, and they rhyme. And it's just like, oh, that's kind of cute. Get and set, get and set. Oh, isn't that sweet? It's just like, it's like teaching nursery rhymes to a child. If you go and look at the dictionary, these are terrible word choices. So I'm a bit of a word nerd. I have a copy of the Oxford English Dictionary on my laptop. It is not a useful dictionary if you want to find out how words are used. Those are called usage dictionaries. This is a dictionary that will tell you what happened to this word in the last thousand years. OK? It's fascinating if you're into that. If you're not, it's terrible. But I'm into that. The most interesting thing about the word get is if you look at the entries, there's four head entries. And I want you to notice the, um, I want you to notice, let's see if this will work. Yep, there you go. I want you to notice that scroll bar is proportional to the size of the entry. And that's only one entry for get. There are three others. 
it turns out that get has, there are three words in the Oxford English Dictionary that have the most w meanings, more meanings than any other word. Get is one of them. Set is the other. And by the way, run is the third, if you were wondering. These words are not unambiguous. They are filled with lots of alternative meanings. But the opposite of set is not get. Get is, well, a set is to change the state of something. To get a variable does not change its state. The opposite of set is un reset or unset. Those are opposites. That's the symmetry. So let's get, just get rid of that. That doesn't give you any more functionality. There is a quote from 17th century English figure, where it is not, uh, Lucius Carey, where it is not necessary to change, it is necessary not to change. Most of those changes, most setters that you see in code are just noise. They're either, they, they don't need to be there, and if they do need to be there, they need more validation. It is possible to put objects into an invalid state. You don't want to create that. That state is the whole problem. Allowing people to create more invalid state, that's a real problem. That's where many of our bugs and Kevlin Henny screens come from. But there's still a problem. And this is the interesting thing. We're doing functional programming, are you? Why are you using imperative naming? You see, that's imperative naming. In English, get does not mean ask a question. We're much more polite than that. Get means change something. Get actually in English means I command you to change the state of something. If you are going to get married, it has a huge side effect on your marital status. If you get money from an ATM, disappointingly, it has an effect on your bank account. Get means I am going to create a side effect. That's what it means by default in English. Why are we adding noise words? Is it not obvious that this is a query? A declarative name just is. It just is the year. It just is the month. Don't give me mechanics. Don't show me the machine. Bring me closer to the domain. Fortunately, Java records have rectified this kind of bad habit, but it's not unique to Java. I see it everywhere. I first noticed it with Microsoft code. We end up with a style of object orientation and programming in general. Let's go back to this list. Do you remember one of the things I took off was assembly? A lot of modern code that claims to be object-oriented is actually object-oriented assembler. Yeah, it's basically, oh, it's like I'm getting and setting and doing and handling and checking and validating. That's exactly, if you've never done assembly, I recommend doing it to understand why I'm saying most code is object-oriented assembler. But even in object-oriented languages, we can be more declarative. Get is not an object-oriented idea. It's an accident. So, of course, naming is hard. There are only two hard things in computer science, as Phil Carton observed. Cache and validation, we'll come to that in a moment, and naming things. So here's another thing that you may not have expected. If I'm talking about how can we make our code more functional in the languages we have available, here's a bit of Python. Um, everybody needs a bank account class, apparently, along with a factorial function. So here's a bank account class. And here is the transaction history. A lot of Python programmers, a lot of Python programmers just, oh yeah, I'm just going to make my, my fields public because that's the easiest thing to do. Yeah, because that's really encapsulated. It allows people to modify without checking the state of your object. Remember, an object is supposed to be a, a state, it's, it's a well-defined piece of state. I want to guarantee that something is in a good state. But if I open it up like this, it means that people can assign anything they want to this. So in other words, the class is actually not really a class. It's just a module with functions. And they're all public. The idea here is that at least, you know, this is, this is not a happy place. At the very least, use the module convention underscore in Python signals to other people. It's just like, OK, you're not really supposed to touch this. It's a bit better. But what you really should be doing is saying, this is as private as I can get. I can't make things truly private in, in Python, but I can make them really awkward. If you put double underscore, then it makes the compiler, you know, it makes the name really awkward. You don't want to use that. So therefore, it makes life awkward. And you can see it in code. Your code is ugly. Now, I would like to think that ugliness in code is a deterrent. 
However, the last three decades of experience suggest that maybe it isn't, but I'd like to think that there's a signal there. Because here's the interesting thing. What we want to do, if you want to get closer to functional programming, you need to get closer to data abstraction. Data abstraction is part and parcel of this idea. Letting side effects in a language that is filled with side effects, Python is incredibly filled with side effects. Letting, letting state out is not what you're trying to do. You're trying to close it down and say, here is what this can do. Nothing else is easily accessible. So what do people do? I run enough workshops and I see enough code where I see people go, oh, I see what you mean, Kevlin. You've got to get the underlying list. And my objection here is not just to the get. Even if we fix it, we still have a problem. We still have a sad face. Because what we've just done is, and we see this as property-based programming in, um, uh, in C Sharp and other .NET languages. People go, oh, yeah, I'll just pass that. It's still encapsulated because it's still private. It's like, well, it's not really private, is it? Everybody can change it freely. What we need to be doing is offering a view. Don't offer the whole thing. Offer a view. So how do you offer a view? I'm going to let this be iterable. You can't change the original thing. You can't modify the original list. You can't replace it with another list. You can't just pull things out of it. You make it iterable. You offer people a view. Now, this is something we know from databases and other network-based things. You don't offer people the thing. You offer them a view of the thing. What's great about software development is it's recursive in nature. The small practices become the big things, and the big things also apply to the little things. What if we took a view-based approach? That doesn't change the side effects that are present otherwise in account. That's a separate talk. But here, what we've done is we've localized them, and we've said that's not one possibility. If I were to do this, you know, I'm now happy. If I do this in, uh, in Java, the way I would do this is to offer that this is an iterator. Here, you can have an iterator, but you're not allowed to mess with anything. Even better, since Java 8, I will say have a stream. So that idea of views takes us back to Facebook, before, again, before they really started messing up the world. This is 2015. Um, this was a really interesting blog piece about how they had used functional techniques when developing instance. Oh, moments, sorry. And they, so they used C++. They, they adopted a number of things. We adopted one-way data flow. API consists of methods to perform fire and forget mutations and methods to compute view models by specific views. To keep the code understandable, we write functional style code converting raw, objects, uh, raw data objects into immutable view models by default. As we identify performance bottlenecks through profiling, we added caches to avoid recomputing unchanged intermediate results. There is an important idea here. It's the recognition that most programming is about an illusion. You maintain an illusion. Okay? Under the hood, there's all this state change, but you offer other developers, you offer them a simple view of the world. We do this with programming languages all the time. Okay? If I work in Java, I'm offering you an illusion of the world that is based in objects. If I go down to the processor and actually look at the instruction pipeline, it doesn't look like objects. Every programming language is an illusion. In fact, all software is an illusion. Your job is to try and maintain it. When you choose one paradigm over another, you are ch you're making a choice of illusions. And then you maintain it. You say, what does it take to sustain this evolution? Some of it comes from the language. Some of it comes from uh, the, the paradigm of the language. Some of it comes from the domain, the libraries, yourself, your colleagues. We're all supporting an illusion. So we're supporting this illusion. It's a, it's a nice way of looking at it. The resulting functional code is easy to maintain without sacrificing performance. You optimize under the illusion. You don't optimize the illusion. Now, we understand the motivation. Here's their motivation. We want it to be understandable and easy to maintain. I'm up with that. How do we do it? Functional. OK, how do we do it? This, interestingly, is a really simple summary. If you, you, know, you can take these uh, five items and, that, and apply them all over your code. And that will probably give it more functional feel than most of the things that you've been do doing. One-way data flow. Kind of talked about data flow, pipelines. Fire and forget mutations. <laughs> If I can't see that there's a state change, then I don't know that there's a state change. So for me, the world hasn't changed. You make separate pieces of code. You give them the illusion that they are in a functional universe. The fact that something else changed, they can't see that. It doesn't affect them. View models. 
immut immutability in caches. So let's go back to Facebook and this particular error, because it allows me to talk about time. How did we end up in the 31st of December, 1969? Well, for those of you who've been paying attention, you'll be thinking, wait a minute, 1969, 31st of December, that's before the 1st of January, 1970. My god, this is the moment of creation. This is the moment before the Big Bang happened. This is the moment before the universe, as we know it, was created, which I'm delighted to say makes me immortal. You know, it's the only upside of being that old. How do we end up back here? The strongest theory I have comes from the C standard, because ultimately the universe is made of C. Well, that's the illusion that I'm going to stick to. That's the illusion that I'm supporting. The universe is made of C. So if I look at the C standard, it turns out that when you ask for the time using the time function, you get back an integer type, numeric type called time t. And it returns minus 1 if the calendar time is not available. I mean, this also, by the way, teaches us something about error handling. Minus 1 also happens to be 1 second to midnight. But what was happening is the time was not available. And rather than treating that as an error, it was converted straight into the 31st of December, 1969. But that's really strange, because you might be thinking, how can time not be available? Surely time is everywhere. So I'm going to quote Anne Hathaway's character from the most excellent film, Interstellar. And there are two perspectives on this film. Either you haven't seen it, or if you don't think it's the most excellent film, you are wrong. Those are the two perspectives. Um, she observes, we need to think of time as a resource. She understood how to do this. I want her on my team. Okay? The Amelia Brown character truly understood this. Time is a resource. It's not infinitely available everywhere. Time comes from places. It's like a file. It's like a socket. Where do I get my time? It's not a global variable. So let's talk about time. Now, I used this in a talk that I gave online for Craft last year, but I'm going to recap this. If I do this in C sharp, there's a very strong temptation. I'm going to have a singleton instance of a clock, and then I'm going to be able to ask it the time of day. What is the time of day now? And that's going to give me code like this which is a bit of a train wreck. You can kind of see singletons where, wherever they are. They're always something dot something dot something. On a bad day, there's something dot something dot something dot something. But you can kind of see that kind of train. It's like, ah. Oh. So to quote Emile Auguste Chartier, nothing is more dangerous than an idea when you have only one idea. And I believe this also applies to singleton. Nothing is more dangerous than an object when you have only one object. So. Why are we imposing that on people? Why don't we just pass it in? Now, notice I'm going to use much more restrained vocabulary. A lot of people say, oh, you need to inject a clock. And you know what? Inject sounds really sexy and really like, hyped up. And it's like, yeah, we're using dependency. You're in I'm sorry. I'm just passing an argument. No, we're injecting dependencies. Could you just inject those two integers into that function? It sounds a lot more racy. It sounds very exciting, but I have really bad news for you. I mean, I know we try and make our job seem way cooler than it is, but you're just passing arguments. That's what it's called. Yeah? Imagine if we just relabeled all the dependency injection frameworks passing argument frameworks. In fact, most of them would just disappear because we realized, wait a minute, isn't that what programming languages do? What dependency injection framework are you using? Oh, I'm using programming language. Wow. Does that do dependency injection? Yeah, it allows me to pass arguments. That's amazing. I didn't know programming languages could do that. I thought we had to operate on global mutable state. Oh, that's so cool. If you want to use inject, I have no objection to it. If it makes you do this, I am absolutely. We are injecting clocks. I mean, honestly, I've had enough jabs over the last two years that I'm prepared to inject anything to avoid problems. And if this helps, absolutely. Inject time. OK. We're also going to stop pretending it's a property. It's not a property. You are making a request. It keeps changing. Every time you look at now, it moves. Make it look like what it is. It's a request of a service behavior. So I can implement it. From the singleton point of view, the classic singleton pattern from the Design Patterns book, you know, they actually had the advice that we want. 
They said program to an interface, not an implementation. Program to an interface, not an instance. This kind of statefulness also holds back. People don't realize it, but it's holding back the potential to, as it were, take advantage of a more functional style. So let's go back to this. And I can make this an interface. Because why is there only one clock? There isn't. There could be many. Now, some people might, you know, the point here is that some people go, oh, yeah, you need a clock impul. Other people will want to put an I in front of everything. I'm not a big fan of that, but I do recognize it's a common convention, particularly in the .NET space. The benefits of using this approach is that you don't need to do any renames on anything that's already deployed. As it, the whole point is it's still compatible from a caller's perspective. The I prefix is an implementation focus that Microsoft has given the world. It's implementation oriented rather than usage oriented. But I do recognize that's a common habit. So I can implement it as a clock? No. Be specific. My system clock. Or I have a network clock. That's the whole point. It's not just don't just take the I off. It's the idea of like actually I'm naming a possibilities, a set of possibilities. So you may also sidestep the naming issue by recognizing why are we creating all these interfaces? Because this is actually a side effect of a lot of mocking culture. And I'm going to blame Java. Because if la I'm going to blame Java because let's put it this way. If the dominant language in the late 1990s had been Python, we wouldn't have mocking frameworks because the whole of Python is a mocking framework. OK? The point here is that it worked around a deficiency of Java. Java was not fully object-oriented. When Java acquired lambdas, it became truly object-oriented in 2014, because now you could treat behavior as a thing. But here's the thing. Why are we passing clocks? Why don't we just pass something, narrow down the scope? Data abstraction, functional abstraction, narrow it down. Why are we passing big things? Pass a small thing. Here is a thing that allows you to get the time. Call it, and you'll get the time. But you know, honestly, most of the time, why don't you just pass the time in? Value injection, let's call it that. Don't inject the thing that gets the thing. Inject the thing that you want. If you look at a lot of code, there's 90% of the stuff that's injected just, could just be the thing that you wanted. To quote the wisdom of the great Morpheus, stop trying to hit me and hit me. If I want the time, give me the time. Don't give me a bloody clock. Just be more direct. Again, interesting enough, Parameterization and using values is a hallmark of more functional and more declarative styles. So we're going to close with a brief section on time. So I'm going to quote the great Neil Gaiman and the absolutely magnificent um, Sandman series, where one of the characters, Delirium, is asking her brother, what's the name of the word for things not being the same always? You know, I'm sure there is one, isn't there? There must be a word for it, the thing that lets you know time is happening. I love that. What a lovely way of putting it. How do you know that time is happening? Her brother responds, change. Oh, I was afraid of that. That's how you know time is happening. This is about time. There is another aspect that people often miss when they are talking about functional programming, or more broadly, declarative programming. What is the nature of time in such a system? The nature of time is like this. In an imperative system, you are imposing a sense of time. You are telling it, this is the program counter. This statement goes to this one. It is highly stateful. Your control flow, even if it doesn't have a variable, this is the interesting thing. Your control flow is filled with state. Every branch or break or continue or early return is a piece of state that you are maintaining without realizing. It's, it, if it doesn't get made, you might not see it in the code, but it's there in your head. It's also actually there in the runtime, the position of something. It's control flow. It's timeful. By contrast, a declarative system has a different characteristic. Time is emergent. Things happen because things become available. This is, if, you, if you do React-based programming, you may be familiar with this idea. It's stateless with respect to time. 
It's about data flow. Availability of data defines the flow of time, not the imposition of control. Do this, do that, do the next thing. It's timeless, quite literally. So this is an interesting point. In many cases, when you are deciding certain things in your code, you are making decisions about the nature of time. If you are saying this code is multi-threaded, that's not an implementation detail. You are defining the laws of physics for your program. You are defining how time works. If you are saying, oh, we're going to do this asynchronous versus synchronous, you've just made a statement about the fabric of space-time in your system. This is why it's so hard to change. It is really difficult to change a system that has a particular notion of time into another system that has a different notion of time. Whether you're talking about it at the level of threads and coroutines, or you're talking about it at the level of acid versus base semantics across a network. You are making statements about time. If I make my objects immutable, they are timeless. I'm saying the relationship of state to time is that it is eternal. If I'm saying that it changes in a different way, I'm making it time full. So there is a kind of a point here about the invisible side of the invisible side of our behavior when we think about functional programming. I don't think we're at the point here where we are going to fulfill any of John Backus's dreams or objections, or any of those in the people that have come since who have advocated functional programming or moved to more declarative styles, whether it be logic-based or strongly data flow oriented. But what we are seeing is that we are hybridizing our approach. But to fully embrace that in the languages that we are using every day is more than just, I'm not going to have setters. It's genuinely looking at all of the detail. And it turns out that we, to get good at this, you need to understand the abstraction concepts that are available to you. The most obvious one is functional abstraction. Every time you do an extract method or use a method from the library rather than write your own, you're using functional abstraction. Every time you decide to pass a block of code as a lambda, you are using functional abstraction. OK, abstracting things out. Every time you take a 19,000 line method and reduce it down to something that people can actually read, you are using primarily functional abstraction. But what surprises many people is if you want to do this, you also need data abstraction. And the final bit that's often missing from people's understanding is control flow abstraction. But control flow is a bias towards imperative. So this is really abstraction of time. What is the nature of time in my system? In other words, temporal abstraction. That idea of, I'm not going to say it should all be timeless. I think we've already recognized we're not going to be able to do that. But we can make our code less timeful by, first of all, recognizing that in the detail of the control flow and the relationship of one part to another, there is a time relationship as well as all the other relationships that we are familiar with. Anyway, I hope that that's been thought provoking, or at very least provoking. And I'm around for the next two days if you'd like to ask me any questions. Thank you very much.